네, 안녕하세요. 블록미디어의 최동력 기자입니다. 오늘은 저희가 국내에서 정말 뜨거운 관심을 받고 있는 프로젝트. 딜리시움은 국내 거래소 빗썸에 상장되어 인터뷰일인 오늘 16일 전체 암호화폐의 거래량 중 1위를 차지하고 있기도 한데요. 과연 어떤 프로젝트에게 이렇게 많은 관심을 모으고 있을지 딜리시움 AGI의 CMO 야닉님을 모시고 함께 이야기를 들어보도록 하겠습니다. 야닉님은 메르세데스, 루이비통, 펩시와 같이 굉장히 다양한 글로벌 다국적 브랜드에서 이력을 거치고 2016년부터 이 업계에 종사해 오신 블록체인 분야의 마케팅 전문가이십니다. 특히 딜리시움에서는 이 인공지능 그리고 블록체인 사이의 관계가 어떠한 구조를 가져가야 하는지도 그 설계와 그 미래를 함께 고민하고 계시다고 하는데요. 과연 딜리시움이 고민하는 이 블록체인과 인공지능의 미래는 어떤 모습일지 야닉님과 함께 그 세부적인 내용 함께 알아가 보도록 하겠습니다. Good day, Yannick. Please provide a brief explanation about yourself and the Delicium. Good day, Ethan. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Yannick. I am originally from Holland, Amsterdam. I was uh, born and raised there. And um, then I came to Asia for, uh, you know, nine years ago, and I've been doing a lot of work around Southeast Asia. And that's me, you know, I, I did a lot of work in marketing and branding, but I've always had this deep passion for, for, um, you know, crypto and blockchain, uh, back in, um, you know, when I was still in, in college, uh, university, the first year that was around uh, nine years ago, I got introduced to the concept of blockchain. Uh, we set up a mining operation, a small one. That was like my first introduction with, uh, with crypto. Then I dropped out for a while because I couldn't really encompass the entire concept and the, the value of, of Bitcoin itself. And then I got reintroduced uh, through NFTs later on. And then I just went crazy. I was like, wow, this is such a great use case. And then I started to combine my passions, you know, my passion for marketing, my passion for branding and design, and my passion for um, blockchain. And that led me eventually to becoming uh, a core contributor at Delicium. So a lot of people know me as the CMO. So I take care of a lot of the communication and external activities. But what people don't know is that I'm actually also very deeply involved in moving the entire project forward. So what does that mean? It means, for example, that I'm one of the co-authors of the white paper. I'm directly involved with, you know, day-to-day -day, um, operations. And I also am very closely involved with the product side, especially with the AI side. Mm. So yeah, that's me. That's great. It's kind of interesting that you are a CMO and also handling with the kind of the strategies and the future of the deletion project. It is kind of interesting that you guys are publishing some kind of new latest white paper recently. And yes. I saw that they have some really interesting title, like right? AI agents needs the ROBS too, right? Yeah. Yes. Could you explain what's the new innovations in this white paper and what's your kind of new futures that is listed on this white paper? Yes. So, you know, AI agents need love too. It's, um, it's, it's a joke, but it's also <laughs> not a joke at the same time, right? Because, so f let, me, let me start off first, because it's kind of important that, you know, people understand the, the context to it. And um, what we're proposing in the white paper is we're proposing a network, an AI agent network. So, you know, like GPTs, uh, OpenAI just released their GPTs, their assistant API. And before they released that, there were already people, you know, building some kind of autonomous or semi-autonomous agents that had capabilities, right? Um, we've seen agents to be able to be very well and very efficient um in for example the customer experience industries and uh, one of our agents that we built for example was lucy and we also saw a, a big use case for lucy so you know they were on the come up and they have been on the come up like there have been speculations of autonomous agents you know since decades it's not a new concept 
But really when blockchain came around in 2013, um, you saw people starting to talk about different concepts related to, you know, like autonomous file storage agents, uh, like store storage, like was one of those uh, concepts back in the day, all the way back in 2012 or 2013. Um, so we've been understanding this and we knew this and we've been looking for it, but the technology wasn't there. That technology wasn't supportive of building these very complex um, agents, but now it is, right? And now all of a sudden, everybody has access to it. You can build an agent, I can build an agent. Within the next two to three months, we will see like a very big leap in innovation in the action space. The action space is um, what the agents can actually do, right? So now we can consider that our agents are already able to access APIs. So if we support our agents with the correct code format, right? The correct structured format, which is um, which can become some kind of like the industry standard and everybody's building in the same way, then basically your, your agent can access anything on the website. Uh, it can access anything from an API and tooling perspective, right? Like as long as you have a key, as long as you give it access to an API, which is basically like a tool, it can do anything, right? So why AI agents need love too, is because if we don't give enough love to our agents, they will not like us and they will come to hunt us, right? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's why we say we need to think about the AI agents, right? We need to think about what is the future for them? Um, not from a very, you know, like let's say ethical perspective, because in the end it's still a computer program, but from a very human centric perspective. It's like, how are these AI agents going to serve us humans in the best way? Yeah, that's kind of funny that I really used to kind of the services like the artificial intelligence chatbots and I usually use the former words because mm -hmm. if someday they get some kind of human consciousness things, may, may they see that, oh, this people is talking to me like they he think he, I am a kind of the true for him and <laughs> maybe someday that they think they are going to yeah, they will come us. Yeah, <laughs> they will come funny, but I think it is really good point about using the AI services. I think it's kind of very interesting things about this AI and the delicious thing is that you guys are really think that it is really important to make a decentralized AI system, right? Yes. But we can also think that it has to be made with the, some single big company because it need a bulk of the GPUs and it need a lot of data. What's the reason that you are saying that it is so important to make a decentralized AI agent in this yeah. network? Yeah, I think this is a very good question. And this is also going to um, tell a story about how we are a little bit different from the traditional, let's say, blockchain perspective and how, you know, maybe some other projects that I know, they say, oh, we're going to put the AI on chain and so on. I don't believe that this is possible. I don't think that blockchain is made to do so. And um, let me let me explain the nuances. I need to be careful. I need to be, be able to facilitate uh, a proper explanation. So let's start with the first thing. Um, the network is not completely decentralized. It cannot be completely decentralized. So very simple, we have one agent and we have another agent and those agents, they need to talk to each other, right? So this would be a straight line of communication. That's the very simplistic way of telling this. But actually maybe you have five agents, maybe you have 1000 agents and maybe somebody else has a million agents and they all need to talk to each other. That's where the complexity starts to happen, right? And now there's another layer which says that, okay, all of these agents, they also need to talk with non-agents. So with like maybe tools or APIs, or maybe, you know, some kind of like currently web interface, but in the future it will be different. So it will be a hugely complex task and it will be hugely complex or a hugely massive network load. So for that, you need a real network. But what is the problem with the real network? And what is the problem with data being transferred through a network? There's no, nobody that's going to be able to say, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. Um, there's no 
you know, easy way to transact information in a secure way. Um, what I mean with secure is that it's not able to be altered, right? So, for example, like we, our agents are interacting and then my agent goes into its data set and changes all the th different types of things around, comes back to your agent and then it says, oh no, I don't have to pay because I made this myself, for example, right? This is a very simple example. So then who is to say that, oh no, well, actually your agent does have to pay, right? So if the data is not immutable, if the registration of the data is not happening, it's very hard to have governance, right? So it's very hard to keep those agents confined to what they are supposed to do for you. So this ties back into um, our philosophy. So we say blockchain is made for AI and AI is made for humanity. It's very similar to the AI agents need love to, right? Mm -hmm. So we say that blockchain has to play a role in AI, but AI is made for humanity. So what role does blockchain then play? Blockchain gives the AI some kind of like box. You say, okay, well, I have an agent ID. An agent ID gives me access to the network. So an agent ID is basically a, a smart contract, right? On that smart contract or that smart contract is connected to our, our chain, um, our blockchain. And this blockchain is then again connected to a chronicle, which is basically like an, uh, a giant ledger that registers all the interactions, that registers all the transactions, and that registers the data. So it doesn't necessarily store the data, but it registers the data. So for example, then if my agent comes to your agent and um, it, it's not in sync, you know, your data is not in sync with what's registered on the Chronicle, you will not be able to access the network. You will not be able to do a transaction. So this is kind of like how we envision to be able to, first of all, protect humans and also protect the agents. So it will be a very well-defined, um, let's say, environment for agents to operate very freely, but it will also be a very safe environment for, for humans to to allow the agents to operate freely. Because if I have a smart contract with my agent and that smart contract is registered on both of the networks, then you know it's immutable. I cannot go out of those boundaries. That's the beauty of, of blockchain. Mm. But if we would have something else, you know, if we just like interface with the large language model, we give it all of these tools and there's no guardrails, then you can just do uh, whatever it wants unless you know, your agent has some kind of like super robust security and the services have very robust security. But the inherent problem with artificial intelligence is that right now we live in an age where robots build robots and code creates code. So at one point we will lose track of what's being created by who and how does it work. It, there will be so much code, there will be so many different standards and so many different languages that we will lose track of everything. And the only thing that will not change is blockchain. Mm, I see. I think what you said is kind of really important when we are thinking about the AI services because we can track the kind of the copyright of the data in the system mm -hmm. without yeah. kind of the system like the blockchain. Yeah. I think that's the reason why you say that decentralized AI platform is kind of really important here. Mm -hmm. Yes. And what I think about this Delicium and the AGI is investors might be curious about how this value is created from this platform and how can they form a kind of concrete foundation for this. In terms of the tokenomics, mm. why are the tokens like the AGI is necessary in the Delicium platform and creating a new kind of star AI platform? Can you say mm. that? Yeah. Yes, yes, definitely. This is also a question that our users ask us a lot, right? So we must first understand that AGI is a governance token. So AGI, its role will be based around governance, um, especially uh, when we are talking about governance of an AI agent, it will be pretty important, right? It's a pretty important task. So we need to be able to control and we need to be able to make decisions um, very rapidly, very quickly, at a very high speed. Because 
the data that's being transacted and the interaction that are performed on the network, they will increase exponentially. Because if you think of it right now, like maybe you have one agent, I have one agent, but in the next five years, maybe you will have 1000, I will have 1000. And that's kind of like my computer program, right? So those, you know, those agents need to be maintained as well. So there will be network fees. Um, those agents need to be registered. So there will be agent registration fees. Those agents need to access services. So there will be service access fees. Um, then there will be, um, you know, the monetary transfers. So the monetary transfers, we're not saying that that has to be done with AGI, but those agents at least need to have some AGI. Um, then we can talk about the very future where we're thinking about some kind of like dynamic scaling and agent evolutions, which basically means that your agent can purchase um, and can contribute to the network and can get access to more resources. So for example, it can um, get access to some kind of like advanced learning algorithms or it can get, get access to data or it can get access to a premium services that other people build on top of the network, right? But um, those are kind of like um, in the backside. What is more important is that it's also governance, right? So like the community that's using the, the, the network will have to have a say in the network because it needs to be decentralized. So if there is some AI agent or an, an institution maybe that tries to take advantage of the network, then how does it work? So for example, we see an institution comes in, uh, they they perform some kind of malpractice uh, using their agents. So through the agent idea ID, their access to the network can be temporarily revoked, right? Um, it can be blocked. Then uh, a council of AI agents, a council of humans, and a council of community members will cast a vote on how you know we are supposed to deal with the situation, for example. And then based off that, we will we will be able to take action as a network. And you know, like the network effect will kick in. So um, it will be hard, you know, for a any single institution to build such a network because we are talking you know about like potentially hundreds of millions of people using this network and then you know billions of ai agents like how are you going to handle that with with a single entity it's impossible mm -hmm. so we're really thinking about you know what kind of role is agi going to play in in, in this perspective um right now if we're talking about right now agi um can be used to uh, purchase the DMAs as of today, uh, which is great. And these DMA, DMAs, they're kind of like nodes um, that give you access to different aspects of our ecosystem. So right now you can get access to Lucy. Lucy is one of our AI agents. We will talk about that more later. And you'll be able to access, you know, these very early stages of development. You'll be able to help us make decisions um, and, you know, become part of the community. And then later on, uh, probably towards the end of 2024, we'll have our launch pad. So on top of that launch pad, we'll have a lot of activities as well. Hmm. Yeah, I think you guys have some kind of insight for the, this kind of AI system and kind of new ecosystem will happen in this area. Because AI itself is kind of a new services in here. So, so many people are amazed about what ChatGPT made in this early year. And what makes your project, Delicium and the AI agent, kind of special here? Because you guys need some kind of special aspects or special utility that makes what, more people to come into your platform and using your services and make your AI much got better. As you know, there is also, we also have the OpenAI and the Anthropic and the Grown, which by X and even the bias from the Google. What's your specialty, you think? Yeah, so I love OpenAI. I love mm. Anthropic. I love the guys over there. They're doing amazing work. Um, I'm really curious to see what Grok is going to bring to the table. I'm not sure if uh, if it's just hype. You know, you never know with Elon. He said his uh, Tesla truck window was bulletproof, but then when he threw <laughs> the ball, the window broke. So, you know, you never know if you can trust his word. But it, it is a truly phenomenal thing to see so many companies to build 
um, models. Um, there's also another model, it's called Pi, Pi.ai. I suggest you, after this you know, call, you can also have a look. It's really a cool, uh, a cool model as well. It's built by one of the ex uh, Google DeepMind uh, co-founders, I believe. Mm. So there are so many models, right? And they're all trying to chase the same thing. They're trying to create a, um, a large language model that can communicate with us humans and that can perform tasks. So right now the focus is very application based, right? So right now the focus is very, okay, we're solving problems for the users and they're still building this infrastructure. The infrastructure for those agents, you know, all the data sets and the training uh, of these models and so on, um, it will take a while before, you know, there's no more hallucination, there's no more speed problems, you know, like right now, for example, I don't know if you've recently used ChatGPT, but, it, you know, as you try to ask for a long answer, it just stops and you need to like rerun it and rerun it and rerun it. You know, there's so many issues with their fundamental technology. So what we realized is that we don't have to beat OpenAI. We don't have to beat Anthropic. We don't have to beat, you know, X. We don't have to go head, head to head with, with Elon Musk or Sam Altman or whatever. We need to work with them. So what is the thing that they are not focused on? They're not focused on building the infrastructure between them. They're not focused on facilitating the user communication, right? So the communication between your AI and my AI, mm -hmm. you know, this is probably the most complex task. Um, the, the complexity is not in building the AI agents anymore because they are solving those problems, right? You know, like GPTs are, to be honest, not a foundation on like a, 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 a extremely new crazy technology, but they're really looking at, okay, what does the user need? How can we make this mm. experience more um, beneficial to the user, more comfortable? So GPTs is an example of that. But yet, you know, like I, I'm not seeing anybody that is trying to solve this interagent connectivity and this communication and really giving it structure. So um, if you look at the agent architecture that we propose in the white paper, in one, which is a profile, and then there is memory, and then there is planning, and then there's action. But we have a, another one, another module that we are working on and that we are trying to standardize, which is communication, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like that's, you can see in the space of, 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 um, of the entire, you know, AI industry, like people just stuck on those four modules, but they completely forgot about the fifth one, which is communication. So we said, okay, let us be that person because we have such a long uh, history. Let us be that t team, actually. Uh, let us be those people that are going to try and take this problem head on in a very early stage. And that made us have to try and like figure out what's going to happen in the next 10 years and 20 years and 30 years and 40 years and even 50 years, right? How is the technology right now improving? What kind of like curve are we looking at? Um, if we adhere to Moore's law, then how fast is it all gonna go? What are our predictions? What are you know open AI's predictions? What are Anthropic's predictions? So we've been working very closely with industry insiders to to make sure that we understand, right? That we understand the entire spectrum and the entire future of this new technology. And we understand what everybody's working on and what's being you know done on the innovation side as well. Um, as you know, we were one of the first companies who actually got access to GPT-3 back in the day. And we have been building AI for the past, I must say, five years. Some of our team members, six years. So we were pre-GPT. Pre we were in AI doing all different types of training, uh, creating models, pretty large models as well. So yeah, that's kind of like the history of our team. So we believe that with our, let's say, our niche, which is not going to be a niche anymore in the next couple of years, but we are one of the very early ones to start building on this with our unique perspective and our unique team background. You know, like I cannot brag that I'm, that I have a background in AI and that I went to university to study AI because I haven't, but I understand it from a very different perspective. I understand it from a, from a human perspective, from a user perspective, from a, you know, let's say, um, uh, communication layer perspective. And then other of our team members, they did go to, you know, they studied artificial intelligence, they started networking 
uh, network um, uh, you know technologies and that kind of stuff right so our team is very diverse which makes it super dynamic um, I like to say like we're, we're in an eternal hackathon and an in eternal internal hackathon because we're always yeah. like, innovate yeah